Now let's review inspection. So when looking at your client, the position of the person is critical to observe. So someone who's breathing easily obviously looks relaxed and upright. Facial expressions also look relaxed. Now, if someone can't breathe, obviously they're going to be panicked. They're going to be anxious. They will often change positions, almost like running a sprint, right? They may have hands on the hips. They might have hands on the head, trying to open up that rib cage, or they often show this tripod position where they're leaning over hands on the knees or even elbows on the knees there. And they're really just trying to get this back rounded to expand the lungs. Now, in terms of LOC, the level of consciousness, the big question you have to ask is really, are they alert? Because remember, oxygen feeds the brain. So really the first sign of deoxygenation is some type of altered level of consciousness. So if someone has good oxygen, they're gonna have a good level of consciousness. So for example, AO times three or AO times four. Fancy words for alert and oriented times three or four. Now, if you take someone's ability to breathe away, they're no longer gonna be alert because their brain's not going to have that oxygen. So they may appear confused, like mentioned before, and this is what's called altered level of consciousness. They may not know who they are, where they are, or even answer simple questions like their date of birth and even the president. So as you know, decreased amount of oxygen is going to the brain and eventually the client is gonna be passed out or basically unconscious. Okay, now moving on to skin color. So obviously someone who is being perfused with good oxygen is going to have those pink undertones. And it really doesn't matter their pigmentation. The key term there is pink undertones. Now, someone struggling to breathe will have first, or basically early deoxygenation, they're gonna have pallor or pallor. And late is that cyanosis, that blue skin tones. Nursing school is hard work. SimpleNursing.com makes it simple. We take your classroom lectures and notes to create a handcrafted study plan with specialized videos and visual study guides that highlight only the top-tested need-to-know key points, coupled with thousands of practice questions to test your knowledge, all neatly organized in our new app. Try it for free today. Visit SimpleNursing.com. Now, what do we know about the conditions of the nails here? With the condition of the nails, like we spoke about before, we're looking at that profile sign or that profile angle. Okay. So normal would be that 160 degrees, mm -hmm. but if it's 180 degrees or more, our club 180, mm -hmm. then that would be clubbing, which would indicate poor oxygenation or that long-term chronic hypoxia. Long-term chronic hypoxia. Those are the key terms for your exams. Now, in terms of the respiratory rate and rhythm, remember normal breathing has a regular rate and rhythm normal inhalation and exhalation or inhale and exhale and it is in a range for normal respiratory rate which is 12 to 20. now if they can't breathe early on the respiratory rate will go up this is what's known as tachypenia so just let the name help you tachy means fast penia is for the lungs now late they're going to have that labored breathing that they can't maintain for a long time so that's obviously going to decrease and lead into bradypenia. So brady meaning slow and penia referring to the lungs. Now in terms of the work of breathing, there's a specific key term known as exertion. This is basically how much effort is the client exerting to breathe. So how do we really kind of assess this? So work of breathing, think how difficult does it look like they're breathing? Usually, okay. like right now I'm looking at my patient and it doesn't look like he's putting in any work at all. Normal, yeah. So sometimes we call that unlabored breathing. Okay. So unlabored or so we don't see any accessory muscle use. They're not having a difficult time breathing. We don't see nostril flaring. Those would be all signs that they are having hard time breathing or their increased work of breathing. And sometimes you'll see that um, abbreviated as WOB, which just stands for work of breathing. So usually if someone isn't having a hard time doing that exertion, it just looks like they're doing no work at all. Now, two big key points to know is when someone is having difficulty breathing or basically too much exertion, they're typically gonna look like this, as mentioned before, this tripod position. We're trying to round the back and have that lung open up. And also this pursed lip breathing, where you can kind of think of like a purse or basically having breathing through a straw. Your lips kind of go like this, kind of like closing a purse or a coin bag. 
or simply breathing through a straw. That's going to help expand the lungs, correct? And it, yes, it can kind of prevent air trapping. So sometimes we even coach our patients with COPD mm -hmm. to do some purslip breathing because it can keep that airway open for a little bit longer if they breathe through those pursed lips. Okay. So now let's talk a little further about accessory muscle use. Okay. So if you think about accessories to like an outfit, that's that little something extra that adds to your overall outfit. Mm -hmm. You know, like maybe you're gonna add a scarf, a watch, a bracelet. Okay. So that little something that helps the big picture. So the accessory muscles are going to be little muscles that help the rest of that lung and ribcage expansion. So that's gonna be these muscles here. Also, it's gonna be the muscles in between the ribs, so those intercostal muscles. Okay. And usually when your patient is breathing and they're not having a hard time breathing, you don't actively see those working, even though they are. But if this patient was having a hard time breathing, you would actively see these little muscles between the rib pulling in and trying to help with that expansion. Mm -hmm. You might even see their shoulders moving up and down with every breath. Makes sense. And that would show that they're having that extra work of breathing because they're using those little muscles in an active way that we can visually see. That makes sense because, you know, the diaphragm is right there as a big muscle and we're trying to use all these other muscles to help us breathe. Absolutely. So another point of inspection, we look at the shape and configuration of the chest wall. Okay. And so we're gonna look at what is the anterior to posterior diameter, which is the front to back, compared to the transverse side to side. And we compare that in a ratio. We want this to be one to two, or sometimes we say that in reverse, a two to one ratio, where the transverse diameter is two times wider than the front to back, the anterior to posterior. So what happens when we have it increased front to back? Barrel chest, right? Yes. yes. So that's when we lose that two to one ratio because of that increased front to back. So yeah. in those patients with that increased front to back, that barrel chest, lots of times we don't see as much in and out. They have more shallow respirations. Right. Because since their chest wall is already out, it doesn't go up and down as well. We have a lot of that air trapping. Now, this is commonly seen in patients with COPD. Absolutely. Or basically patients with emphysema who've smoked a lot and they've basically broken off those alveoli in the chest and now air just gets trapped in there, expanding that chest wall. So they have a lot of air trapping. And so that's why we have that barrel or round chest. And so along with that shape and configuration of the chest wall, we have the costal angle. So costal basically means ribs. Okay. So the costal angle is going to be this angle right here on the front of the rib cage. So we want that costal angle to be about 90 degrees. 90 degrees. So this angle in the front of the ribs be about 90 degrees. And that's what you see in someone with that normal chest wall configuration of the two to one ratio. Interesting, okay. So if you have a patient with barrel chest with that increased front to back, what happens is that costal angle actually increases, is going to become bigger than 90 degrees. So it'll almost look obtuse or basically flat. Absolutely. Now for a practice question, which of the following assessment findings is associated with a costal angle? Increased in emphysema and even pregnancy. So guys, many students get this incorrect. Remember, emphysema, we have air trapping. And think about pregnancy. We have a big, huge belly here with a little baby fetus growing inside the belly. So both will increase that costal angle there. 